Jerry Garcia was one of the most iconic musicians of the 20th century. He was a multifaceted professional, singer, songwriter, pedal steel player, five-string banjoist. Jerry was most well known as a guitar player who blended rock, folk, blues, country, bluegrass, and countless other influences into a style that was all his own. Despite devoting his life to pushing musical boundaries with the Grateful Dead and a host of other groups and musicians, he is often viewed by onlookers as someone who noodled and spent his time on stage running scales. Even Mike Gordon of Fish famously threw his two cents on this idea. When I was a freshman at the University of Vermont in 1983, I traveled to dead shows when I should have been studying electrical engineering. A guy in my dorm used to razz me by saying, getting together and playing like the dead is the easiest thing in the world. You just go up and down Mixolydian scales together. There's an element of truth to that, of course, but you also need years of experience or moments of true abandon to know when to go up the scale and when to come down. Almost every Grateful Dead fan I've ever met, particularly ones that are musicians, has had a conversation similar to this at one time or another with a non-fan. Arguments and other instruments aside, Jerry's unique improvisational approach on guitar is what made him stand out amongst his peers. Although Garcia may not have been a traditional jazz guitar player, he inherently used jazz approaches in his playing, fueled by a lifetime of being a lover of the genre. As Miles Davis said in his memoirs, So it was through Bill that I met the Grateful Dead. Jerry Garcia, the guitar player, and I hit it off great talking about music, what they liked and what I liked, and I think we all learned something, grew some. Jerry Garcia loved jazz, and I found out that he loved my music and had been listening to it for a long time. He loved other jazz musicians too, like Ornette Coleman and Bill Evans. In an October 1978 issue of Guitar Player, Garcia also mentioned that he was a huge fan of several other jazz titans, such as Pat Martino, George Benson, and Al DiMiola. He also confessed of having an obsession with the music of both Duke Ellington and Art Tatum. Although Jerry played with fusion groups, made records of standards, and shared the stage with jazz legends and luminaries such as Ornette Coleman and Branford Marsalis, I often hear Jerry get written off as someone who didn't execute or even understand the language of jazz. As a starting point, let's take a few seconds of a great jazz solo and see some of the approaches that a master jazz improviser would use. Here's a few seconds from Society Red, an F blues written and originally performed by Dexter Gordon in 1961. <laughs> We can clearly see five devices or ideas that occur in the solo that are a staple of jazz improvisation. Let's compare Dexter's solo with a Jerry Garcia improvisation from May 8, 1977 at Cornell University with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> We can pinpoint every one of these five musical devices in just these few measures of Garcia solo as well. In these examples, both Jerry and Dexter use one of the most central concepts in jazz improvisation, which is focusing on chord tones. Chord tones are merely notes or tones that exist within a chord. In Society Red, the first chord is an F7, which contains the notes F, A, C, and E flat. These comprise the four chord tones, the root, the major third, the fifth, and the flat seventh degrees. Dexter hones in on the root, third, and fifth when he gets to this F7 chord, just like Jerry hones in on the root, third, and fifth of the G chord, the first chord in They Love Each Other's solo section. But both of them don't just play these chord tones alone. They surround or enclose them with other notes to spontaneously create beautiful melodies. Gordon plays.
At first, it may sound like this is some exotic, advanced jazz scale that he used to play such an elegant line, when in fact he uses a very simple formula to enclose chord tones. He plays up a scale tone, lands on the chord tone, travels down to a chromatic tone below, and lands back up on the chord tone. Jerry uses almost the exact same enclosure formula to start his solo on the Cornell 77 They Love Each Other, with an off-kilter phrase that is just bursting with color. We see that he approaches the root from a chromatic half step below, plays up a scale tone of the third, and then another half step below, and then lands on the third. He slides up the neck and continues the formula, up a scale tone, down a half step below the chord tone, and then lands on the fifth of G. Up a scale tone, down a half step from the root, and then lands on the root. He does the same thing with the third, then the root, then back down to the fifth. What sounded like an out there scale is in reality just a classic jazz formula for enclosing chord tones. Jerry continues his solo. There are a few notes in this phrase that particularly stand out. This note E that Jerry lands on is the sixth of G, also known as the 13th. This note D that Jerry lands on here is the second degree of C, also known as the ninth. Why do chord tones have different names? What is the point of giving them two number designations? Isn't music theory complicated enough already? This gets us to one of the biggest distinctions of how jazz improvisers view the very essence of melody and harmony. Scales and modes are typically absorbed by musicians as a linear idea. Here's the G major scale played from root to root, ascending one scale tone at a time. But jazz improvisers don't only view a scale in this fashion. And that's because chords are typically built of stacked thirds, so why can't scales be constructed the same way? What happens when we build the G major scale on thirds? It turns out that we get the exact same notes that we had in the linear model, but it gives us a fuller picture of the sound and function of each note within the scale. The first, third, fifth, and seventh degrees happen consecutively. Then we get the extensions, the ninth, eleventh, and thirteenth, which are just the second, fourth, and seventh degrees of the scale, but in this case, up an octave. These extensions have a bit more tension than the one, three, five, and seven, and they typically want to resolve to the next closest chord tone, which is exactly what Jerry does. He resolves the 13th to the 5th in G, and he resolves the 9th to the root in C. Dexter's solo is also full of extensions that resolve to close chord tones. And here's where the eternal question comes up. Are these musicians consciously thinking about these concepts in the moment? Chances are, particularly in the case of giants like Dexter Gordon and Jerry Garcia, they are not thinking in such concrete ways when they are improvising. But they have a deep, masterful command of all of these tones over different chords. Just like a painter can mix colors or utilize shades to evoke a feeling, master improvisers use tools like chord tones and extensions to tell a story, since each of these notes has a different tone color. These tools, combined with the imagination of whoever uses them, is what gives us meaningful melodies that make up solos like these. What we're doing here is just giving labels to these colors, but rather than using visual colors such as red or blue, we give them names like the root, or the fifth, or the thirteenth. In the same excerpt, we notice that Garcia connects the flat seventh of G7 to the third of C, giving us a smooth transition from chord to chord. We also see Dexter connecting the flat seventh of F to the third of B flat. Jazz improvisers love to focus on guide tones, which are tones that capture the very essence of the chord. In jazz and popular music, we often see the thirds and sevenths acting as these guide tones. For example, let's look at the chords in Society Red, a very common blues form in jazz. If we just take the third and seventh of each chord, we can capture the entire essence of the progression with only two notes per chord. Mm -hmm. 
this is why connecting the third of one chord to the seventh of another, or vice versa, is a very common approach in improvisation, because it effectively and smoothly addresses the harmony in a colorful way. Finally, we see another hallmark of jazz in Jerry's solo. Here, Jerry connects the third of G to the fifth of G chromatically in a lick that sounds almost stereotypically jazzy. We see that Dexter similarly connects the major seventh of B flat to the fifth in the second bar of his solo. Chromaticism is the approach of playing in half steps, which are the smallest functional units that Western music is founded upon. The keys on a keyboard are spaced by half steps, just as the frets on a guitar are spaced by half steps. Both enclosures and chromatic lines are ways of incorporating passing tones into improvisations. These are methods where you can pass through or around tones that are outside of our scale to add color, excitement, and emotion. So, was Jerry Garcia a jazz improviser? I think if he had devoted his life to playing traditional jazz, he would have worked hard and hustled enough to make a career out of it. Who knows, perhaps in an alternate universe, Jerry spent his days in the 60s playing hard bop, or in the 70s playing show tunes, or in the 80s with a Latin jazz fusion band.